Urban Squeeze. And our two favourite urban planners, in fact, the only two that we know, to be fair, but they're here again, and it's good to have them along. I'm talking, of course, of Associate Professor Jason Byrne, Dr Tony Matthews, urban planners with the School of Environment at Griffith University. Gentlemen, it's been a while. It seems a while anyway. Hello. Yeah, that's good afternoon, Matt. Good to have you back. I have a week off. I feel like you're strangers to me again. <laughs> Not really. Not really. Green space. Now, I'm sort of, I've been thinking about this and thinking about how I use green space or open space on the coast. It's a place to sit and think, to ponder peacefully, um, sort of escape the rush of the day to day and, and unwind a little. Let the kids off the leash, so to speak. They can go and run, maybe the dog too, uh, while I just sit and watch and enjoy. Um, how important is these kinds of spaces or are these kinds of spaces in an urban environment? And I suppose, do we have enough? They're great questions, Matt. So Tony and I have been having a bit of a chat about this, as you can imagine, <laughs> it's our favourite topic. This is what you talk about. Yeah, yeah. so we this talk about it all the time. A lot of what we do. Yeah. Um, they're, they're critically important and there's a variety of different perspectives that we could look at. So you've already mentioned around sociability, mm. so places for the kids to run and let off steam, places for people to hang out, have a barbie in the park, get to know each other, to chat, that kind of thing. There's also the um, kind of economic benefits of green spaces and they're not often thought about. They're almost like an afterthought. Um, many local authorities I know tend to look at parks and green spaces as a liability uh, lawn mowing expenses, maintenance mm. expenses. You know, you can run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for a local authority to just mow the lawns. What we don't actually think about are some of the economic benefits that, that come about from green space. And we can talk about that in a little bit. Mm. But, for example, research in the United States has shown that being near a park can increase property values by 20%, which is quite amazing. We've had a little bit of research in Australia around a this. A fifth? A fifth. Wow. Right. A little bit of research in Australia. There's been a study done in the early 2000s looking at Noosa National Park. So a view of Noosa National Park increased property values by 7%. Being in walking distance, we talked about walkability recently, right? Mm. Being in walking distance increases property values by as much as 15%. So there's some economic benefits as well. But there's a whole range of kind of functioning and regulatory benefits, right, Tony, that we've been talking about with green spaces as well. Yeah, so green spaces have a, a huge amount of value. And one of the difficulties... Um, out there is the fact that councils don't necessarily understand the dollar values around these benefits. So they look at green spaces and they see, as Jason said, maintenance and the cost of mowing lawns and keeping trees maintained and that sort of thing. But they're not necessarily... Uh, and dare I say, perhaps an opportunity foregone. I mean, the, the talk of developing the spit, I know it's controversial. Did people have different views on how that uh, particular part of the Gold Coast should look moving forward um there's different views on all of this there are of yeah yeah and and, and that tends to put the existing green spaces that we have uh, under a degree of pressure um sometimes not very welcome pressure depending on which side of the mm. argument you stand on but just looking at the benefits that jason um alluded to with green spaces i mean socially and you said it as well green spaces reduce stress we know that um, they reduce uh, negative health outcomes, they foster active living, so they get people out there and using the space and moving around, like you said. Um, they moderate bad behaviour, people tend to behave themselves better, there's lower rates of violence in green spaces, so there's a heap of social benefits. There's economic benefits as well, and these are not necessarily things that you'll connect up or that are commonly connected. So one thing that green spaces can do, which is a huge economic return, is they're very, very good at managing stormwater costs. Huh, so yeah. they'll actually they'll absorb stormwater rather than it cascading across hard surfacing and cities tend to be on average about two thirds hard surfacing. So if you're looking down on a city, two thirds of it is, is, is hard concrete or, or bitumen or, or, or some similar substance. But green spaces um, soak up excess rainfall and stormwater as opposed to allowing it cascade across streets or across channels and then taking it off to be processed elsewhere in a stormwater treatment plant. So that saves an awful lot of money, but we don't generally put a dollar value on that and we should. Um, probably the biggest benefit that green spaces offer overall uh, is in managing heat stress. And heat stress is Australia's number one natural killer. It kills more Australians than cyclones, bushfires and floods and storms combined. Heat stress is the number one natural killer here. The number one way of dealing with heat stress is more green space. So we, we talked about this last week, right, when we were talking about street trees, mm, mm, mm. before you went on holiday? Before I went and enjoyed some green space. Right. Yeah. And 
I think some listeners might recall that we were talking about the ability of trees over roads to cool temperatures by up to 20 degrees over the road surface, right? It was quite mm. phenomenal. Mm. But even ambient temperatures. Um, so there's been a bit of discussion this past week about Upper Cooma and all the trees have been cleared and how hot it is up there. So the ambient temperatures can be as much as 6 to 10 degrees lower in a suburb with good green space. And Tony's got some really interesting figures here where you look at each one of those one degree changes. How does that translate into health outcomes? So we know, Tony, for example, one degree yeah. difference can affect. So just before you speak, I should, should invite, just remind people that I'm happy for you to call in. So are the gents, Jason and Tony, with me today. one three hundred nine zero three ninety one seven. Perhaps you've seen the benefits of more trees in an area. They've been planted, now they're growing. You're getting a bit more shade. Perhaps you've noticed something tangible. Or a favourite um, park that Favourite park love. That, uh, that you enjoy. Perhaps you notice the difference in, uh, in climates just a street away. Uh, perhaps give me a call. I want to hear some practical examples if you can come up with them. one three hundred nine zero three ninety one seven. 903 Tony, your numbers. My numbers, because I know you like numbers, Matt. So we know that a one degree Celsius rise in temperature above standard ambient air temperature uh, leads to up to 3% increase in mortality risk. Um, so for every successive one degree you get, you get more mortality risk. So that's more potential for, for death amongst the population. And that leads to huge health care costs because you have more ambulances on the road, you have more demand on hospital services, you have uh, uh, beds being taken up by people with heat stress that might mm. otherwise be used for, for patient, patients with other needs. But we also know that an increase of 5% in tree cover in an area can lower ambient air temperatures by more than 2 degrees. So if you put those things together, basically a small amount of tree planting brings down uh, the risk of death from heat stress substantially, which substantially lowers the costs and burdens that are placed on the health system. So in short, trees save lives and they save money for the health system. They are in effect the cheapest way of managing heat and the negative health implications, including death, that go with excessive heat. Rightly or wrongly, I'm just imagining in my mind all the aged care facilities that you see that, uh, well, bare, naked of, of trees and foliage around them when you would have thought the opposite would be the, uh, the, the, the appropriate way to go. So there have been, been a whole range of studies, Matt, which show that just a view over greenery can improve mental restoration. So it can improve people's ability to concentrate, their ability to focus, but it can also combat fatigue. So you can imagine people in a retirement village maybe not necessarily being terribly happy. Mm. A view over greening is a really great way to promote mental restoration, but also encourage greater sociability between them. But you know, those numbers that Tony was talking about are really kind of important when you scale it up. So if you look at the heat wave that went through Russia not so long ago, remember that when there were big fires, that kind of stuff that mm. broke out? So there were 11,000 people that died in that heat wave as a result of increased temperature. Gee. Right, so these, yeah. are, these are big numbers. So, but you, we can go even bigger than that. The heat wave that, that um, moved through Europe in the summer of 2003 hit mm -hmm. particularly hard. I remember hard. that too. Yeah. yeah. The estimates are that across the continent, heat-related deaths were, were somewhere in the region of about 70,000. Mm. And in France alone, in August of 2003, 14,000 people died from heat stress. And the temperatures that were associated with that heat wave we're sort of up in the high 30s, which frankly are not that uncommon in this part of the world. So far from exposure to heat stress in this part of the world is extremely high. And so if we're looking at, at, at this level of, of mortality and associated costs to the health system and other systems and loss of tax revenue, all that sort of stuff, um, these become particularly frightening figures. Um, but there's something that we can we can deal with relatively easily and quickly and cheaply uh, if, if we have the will to do so. Is it fair to say that uh, older elements of the, the population are at most at risk of heat stress. And uh, younger. So uh, both ends of the spectrum. Both ends of the spectrum. And, so and anyone with a compromised immune system and pregnant women. Okay. Right. So right um, people, you know, younger than younger than five years old kind of stuff, especially vulnerable young children. So there are implications when you factor in an ageing population as well. As well, uh, a, like a, the Gold Coast. adds a, an element of significance to it. Urban Squeeze this afternoon, Associate Professor Jason Byrne, Dr Tony Matthews with me as always on a Thursday afternoon, talking about the importance of green space and putting some numbers to uh, to measuring its importance this afternoon as well. one three hundred nine zero three ninety one seven. the number if you have a story 
story to share, a place that you like to go, a place that you used to go that is no longer there. Perhaps you've noticed a, a difference in your community as a result of perhaps a development going somewhere that used to be something else. I don't know. There's plenty of ways to, to look at this. one three hundred nine zero three ninety one seven. the number. Um, can we get a bit Gold Coast centric yeah. here? I asked mm -hmm. the question at the outset. We talk about the Gold Coast from what we see at its edges, a lot of the time in terms of its natural beauty, the beach, it's spectacular. I'm pointing in the wrong direction that way. Uh, the beach is, uh, is beautiful. The hinterland behind me, spectacular. What about green space in the middle of this city? Do we have enough of it? Yeah, we did some research a few years ago, just using a geographic information system, a GIS, to look at the spatial distribution of green space. In many cities around the world, like in Los Angeles, there's a chronic shortage of green space. Mm. So in the heart of Los Angeles, people have on average less than the size of a suburban backyard for every 1,000 residents. Gee. So that's, that's chronic, right? Yeah, yeah. We don't find that on the Gold Coast. Gold Coast is, has pretty generous allocations of green space. But Tony and I were kind of joking on the way. What you do see on the Gold Coast, though, are these kind of little, almost pathetic or apologetic pockets of green with a sign out the front, so-and-so family park, mm. and it's a bit of lawn with a spindly tree, and it's really just a glorified traffic island, right? There's a lot of that around the coast. That does, that's not really functional, doesn't provide a lot of benefit. Equally, there are these parks that people might be familiar with. You see them around here, fairly sprawling, a few trees, not much equipment. Again, that doesn't really encourage much use. If you remember back to walkability a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about what gets people walking. We can see the same thing occurring in parks. What makes an amazing park is a place where there's intentional design. So there's good, good features there. There's exercise equipment, for example. Mm. There are um, a wide variety of things for the kids to play on and not just the kind of candy coloured play equipment, you know, with the safety rubber mats and stuff around it, but adventure kind of opportunities for kids to really grow and explore and test their abilities and skills, that kind of stuff. I think of that fabulous park um, a little further north of here in Brisbane, but at New Farm, uh, sprawling, you know, kids playground under the shade of uh, some magnificent Moreton Bay fig trees. It's quite a, a specific, I don't know if you're familiar with it, plenty of listeners will be though yeah. when they yeah. visit New Brisbane. Farm Park. Yeah, New it's Farm, it's spectacular. And an and incredible well used. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's it's in constant demand for everything from weddings to birthday parties, kids' parties, you name it, it's going on there uh, on a weekend in New Farm Park. It's also got the, the lovely feature of being accessible by ferry, which is wonderful too. Yeah, an amazing um, thing. But also, <laughs> conversely, out in the middle of it, there's a whole lot of barren area. It's just basically grass baking in the sun right. too. So uh, you, you sort of see the good and the perhaps not so. So if you breath. look at the Broadwater Parklands, it's another really good example of an amazing park with lots of facilities where kids love to go. Um, we both talked a lot about our travels. So in Barcelona, when I was there, I was blown away by the fact that they had parks with uh, a little cafe, but at the cafe you could buy a glass of wine and you could sit there and have a glass of wine watching your kids play safely mm. in the park and just chill out with other people, right? So that can improve sociability as well. But we also need to be thinking about these kind of big stretches of grass, what else they could be used for. Community gardening is a really good example. So just up the road here on McCurry Street, there's a little community garden that started up a multicultural garden yep. in what's an otherwise fairly large grassy kind of area that's really beginning to turn the community around, right? People are going and having a look and uh, wanting to take up gardening and getting to know each other, and it's beginning to sort of trickle down in how that park's used. So design matters, right, Tony? Oh, design really matters. And, and people love having these spaces and these amenities where they can come together and meet and socialize and 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 and, and share interests and so uh, communal gardens are a big thing um, allotments are another thing that are hugely popular when and where they're provided people love growing their own food mm. Even, I mean the, most people have no no real uh, hope of growing enough to replace the supermarket but you know growing one lettuce for yourself is a triumphant <laughs> experience for a lot of people so allotments are really important and valuable as well and again they're great for community cohesion no tomato tastes as good as the tomato absolutely you not yourself. no right. definitely mm. not we tend to, you know, we tend to take some of our green spaces for granted Matt so you mentioned this middle area of the Gold Coast yeah. the kind of the donut area if you want yeah. there was a proposal that council had two or three years ago called the Green Heart and it's absolutely visionary you know this this is on a par with New York Central Park just absolutely amazing this vision and it's kind of been shelved unfortunately but what it what it had in mind was an interconnected series of green spaces over those floodplains that really can't be used for much else 
some of them for what we call passive recreational so, functions. Yeah, let's talk specifics. Specific, specific so, zones here, Madrabar. Madrabar, yeah. Carrara, these kind of yep, areas, right? Yep. So when we, when we look at this, you could have what we call passive recreation, so watching people, watching wildlife, going along a boardwalk, that kind of stuff, or, and active recreational opportunities, uh, kicking a football, throwing a frisbee, and connected with the stadiums and things we have on the floodplain as well. Yeah. That kind of thing would transform the city. It would make the Gold Coast one of the world's great cities, without a doubt. I mean, it's already a pretty special city, but having something like that would completely radically change the Gold Coast. It would, and it, I, I mean, much of what's needed is, is actually already there. The green space is effectively already there. What it needs is infrastructure to bring it together. Yeah. So it needs social infrastructure like tables and shading and toilets and that sort of stuff. And then just little paths to connect up the various pockets of it. And you could have a, a, an extensive green space. As Jason says, I mean, you would be talking a world-leading green space here, you know, equivalent to Central Park uh, in terms of its size, its variability, its use, its attractiveness. Uh, so, you know, kudos to the council for having such a vision. Uh, it's a pity it doesn't seem to be going anywhere at the moment, but maybe it'll get resurrected. We There's a bit so. of that. There's a bit of that going on presently. One three hundred nine zero three ninety one seven. If you want to join the discussion, please do. Uh, Tony Matthews, Dr. Tony Matthews, Associate Professor Jason Byrne from the School of Environment at Griffith University, talking urban planning, the importance of green space. Do you have a favourite spot on the coast that you like to sit and ponder? Tony's from Miami. Tony, hello. Hi, Matt. How are you? Going particularly well this afternoon. What did you want to say? I just that uh, you were talking about green spaces, how they need sort of a, uh, swings out, all that sort of stuff, infrastructure. I was just thinking the I love the dog park at Mountain View Avenue at Miami. And for a dog park, you don't really need anything. Just uh, somewhere where they can have a drink and let the dogs go wild and all the owners get together and have a great chat. Have a bit of a yarn. The sociability element, Jason, you were talking about this before. And dog parts are taking off around the world, so you know this is a really good point. Um, they're becoming increasingly popular. They're a place where people can get together. Dogs like to socialise as well, right? There's lots and lots of dogs in cities like the Gold Coast. They need a place where they can run off leash and, and hang out together. Oh yeah, this, uh, this country. Amazing. Yeah, this country has one of the highest rates of dog ownership in the world. So uh, a lot of people have dogs. A lot of people like having dogs, and lots of people like taking their dogs out for exercise. You, so that's you a really don't hear stories of the sociability, though, but as soon as one person gets nipped by one dog that's off its lead or isn't being controlled in the way it should, it's everywhere. Tony, how often do you get to the park? Uh, well, I, I, I go to the beach or the park once a day, and if I go to the beach, I've got to keep my bigger dog on a leash. He can't have as much fun when I take him down to the dog park. He's off the leash. He's running around like a haniac with the other dogs. He comes home and he has a great sleep. It's, uh, it's really good. Win-win. Good on you, Tony. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time, Matt. See you. Tony from Miami there, kind of proving part of your point. Jason? Yeah, we don't, you know, we actually don't think very much about animals in the city either. And we take it for granted that cities are only places for humans. But the dog is a case in point. There's lots and lots of animals that depend on parks for their existence as well. Mm. Um, Parks and green spaces we know now can increase biodiversity. Gold Coast has a lot of high biodiversity, mainly because of that beautiful hinterland you talked about. It's like 50% of the, the municipal area is natural area. But there's other animals in the city that depend on these spaces too, right? And I know fruit bats drive people crazy with smells, that sort of stuff, but they, they have a kind of role in, in the city also. Don't oh. start us on koalas. We've talked a lot about koalas as well in, in recent times. There are things to think about. We're, we're living in someone else's patch of dirt most we are. of the time. Yeah. Um, what can we do differently then, going forward? Good question. Tiny. You see, this is... This is a, I like how you throw the good question. It's <laughs> a <laughs> quick handball. Well, we, we did some, as Jason mentioned, we did some work looking at, uh, at, at levels of heat stress um, in Upper Coomera, which was featured earlier this week in the Bulletin, and Jason has done some, some other media around this. Um, and one of the problems that you have in a place like Upper Coomera, and this is increasingly becoming common in new suburbs that we're building, is because um, we have a rising population, we have a need to put more people in less space. So what tends to happen is gardens are shrinking uh, and w so there's not a lot of garden space around houses now mm. uh, in newer suburbs relative to what there would have been in more traditional suburbs and then street verges where you would normally do your street tree planting are giving way to car parking spaces because the houses often come right out to the roadway they don't have driveways or whatever so you so you're losing greenery all the time and then what you you get is, is this, this sort of heat island or heat sink effect where you don't have enough greenery in the area and it's causing the whole place to heat up and everybody's electricity bills are skyrocketing because they're 
turning up the AC to deal with the heat. So is there something to to be said for the choice of foliage that's used? I mean, tree, trees take time to grow. They do. There, um, there are other options beyond trees. You can do things like green roofs or green walls. Um, uh, if you have a green roof on your house, it can it can lower your your, your internal temperatures by up to eight degrees Celsius. They're not literally very, a green roof. Or yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah. So I mean, effectively, I mean, it's waterproof, of course, but it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, a waterproof roof with a with a green um, uh, sod lining on top of it, which can be anywhere from maybe three inches in depth to twelve. Wow. Um, and sometimes you got to get up there with the mower and actually mow the thing. But they're <laughs> they're not that common in this country uh, or in this part of the country because we don't have heavy winters here, so you can tend to get some problems with pests and things like that. But designing greenery into settlements is 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 tricky and it's something that the property development industry is a bit wary about despite the advantages that go with it um they're not sure how to do it they're not sure what the dollar value is they're not sure what it does for saleability of the properties and things like that we're hoping to do some work on that ourselves in the future try and figure some of that out um but getting more greenery into spaces is really important and i take your point about trees trees do take time to grow and they need space to grow um so we should be designing them in to begin with. If we're not, we should be looking at alternatives, like how we site or orientate houses or adding green walls or green roofs or some kind of natural shading, even if it's not trees, bamboos or something like that will grow quickly and provide a lot of shading. Uh, there are options out there, but um, we're tending not to pursue them because there are questions about the cost benefit ratios and there's also questions about species selection so the research is really active but ongoing in that space right now mm, it's so some of the things matt that you and tony were just talking about before really get back to this idea of multifunctionality. if you've got a single function green space it's not going to be as successful as one that's performing multiple multiple functions so we can design our green spaces to have stormwater in them for example so mm. we can kind of put the two together we can also think about how we might activate existing green spaces. So these big areas of parkland that don't seem to be used very much, the suburbs gotten older, that kind of stuff. Maybe we could be selectively zoning around those parks to increase density, and that will reactivate that park. So people will then have restaurants and cafes next door to the park. You can spill out from upstairs down onto the park space. Mm. You're not stuck in that predicament that we have at the moment where we're building these high-rises with not not enough green space around, right? The green space is there, you activate it. A bit of that going on in Melbourne, down Portside with the redevelopment there about centering, almost like the village green, centering development around the village green and for dogs, people to kick a footy, whatever it is, it, it attracts foot traffic yeah. and that sociability element. There's a well. citywide oh. urban greening strategy in Melbourne right now and actually the federal government has recently launched a nationwide urban greening strategy because they recognise that this is necessary for, for, for heat management and also for amenity and social good. So that this is coming, but it's taken a while to get up. Yeah, OK. We'll have to call it quits there. We're out of time. We could go on forever. We could. As we usually can. Uh, Associate Professor Jason Byrne, Dr Tony Matthews from Griffith Uni, the School of Environment specifically, the Urban Squeeze for another week. Back next week. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. See you then, gents.